Well, hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar on ASC 842, Lessons Learned from Early Adopters. Today's webinar will enable you to identify the most common pitfalls and how to avoid them, evaluate the best lease accounting technology solutions for your industry, and create a plan to keep your organization compliant. Now, we know organizations must keep up with change. So today, through the lens of ASC 842 Lessons Learned from Early Adopters, we're going to be focused on navigating disruption, empowering operations, and digital transformation, which will help you stay informed and up-to-date with today's marketplace demands. Companies that have already put ASC 842 into effect have a wealth of knowledge to share, and this webinar offers first-hand access to their experience, plus practical tips to help you prepare for these new lease accounting standards. Before I pass it off to our presenters, I have a few tips on using the Zoom platform so you can engage with the presenters and have the best experience possible. You should see the following icons on your Zoom toolbar, ask a question, chat, and raise your hand. You can ask a question or chat using the submit a question at any time or with any comments. If you need any assistance, click on the raise hand and I will connect with you as soon as I can. We do encourage you to ask questions throughout the entire presentation, and we will address the questions toward the end of the webinar. If you experience audio issues, you can access your audio settings and test your audio when you are already in the meeting. At the bottom left-hand corner of the Zoom meeting toolbar, you'll find either the headphone or microphone logo to join audio. Click join audio to choose to connect your computer audio or dial into the meeting with a phone. Today's webinar does qualify for CPE credits, so in order to qualify, you do need to respond to all the polling questions and stay on for the entire duration of the webinar. If you do have any technical difficulties answering the polling questions, please email elevatelearn at armanino.llp.com with your name, date, and name of the webinar, along with your responses to the polling questions. And with that, I'll hand things off to our presenters as we explore today's topic, ASC 842, Lessons from Early Adopters. Dan, Courtney, take it away. All right, good morning, good morning all. Good morning to everybody participating in this webinar. And thank you, Jonah, for the intro. Uh, just would like to give a quick intro of, of this speaker. Uh, my name is Dan Ward, and I have been in the audit business since before all these standards changed. So uh, 21 plus years, and we're going to go over some of these changes, specifically how and why we are here, and the changes we are experiencing in this lease accounting area. The accounting story of this century, actually, begins with Enron the largest user of off-balance sheet vehicles, which had a material impact on their financial reporting. And by material, I mean it ended them. This led to an enhanced oversight role by our federal government over accounting and auditing of issuer entities in the form of legislation known as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Concurrent with these two items, the accounting standard setters were interested in creating a one-world gap all of this within a three-year period at the beginning of, of the 21st century. This ongoing convergence project between FASB and the IASB tackled many topics, the largest being revenue recognition, which we all had fun adopting, leases and fair value accounting, another item we've all had fun adopting. Leases is last on the list. And lastly, the other item of import was an SEC report to Congress mandated by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and they addressed the extent of off-balance sheet transactions on financial reporting and concluded that lease accounting as currently codified under U.S. GAAP needed to change. These items led to the change in accounting for leases and is codified under ASC 842, and that is why we are here today. 20 years of hard work by the standard setters, set off by one massive accounting failure. This standard can be expressed best using a quote from the 1987 movie, Full Metal Jacket. It's a huge blank sandwich, and we're all gonna have to take a bite. 
So let's discuss the makeup of the sandwich. For calendar year ends, your 1231 financial statements will be the first time you're required to present your statements under this new lease accounting requirement. The largest impact for leases, the largest impact will be for leases. And those leases, and those leases uh, classified as operating leases. Current standards do not require operating leases to be recognized on the balance sheet. They are only disclosed in the, the footnotes to the financial statements. This new requirement will require the organization to record a lease liability for operating leases with the corresponding plug to a new asset class called right of use asset. The income statement and statement of cash flows are unchanged. The presentation will not change under this new standard. This standard is driven by, creates the largest impact by requiring to present at a discounted rate, the lease liabilities on the balance sheet with the plug to the right of use asset. Capital leases will now be called finance leases with a change to a principles-based determination of finance lease classification versus the current bright line test for capital lease determination. And short-term leases are defined as those under 12 months in length and with an accounting policy election may be excluded from recognizing on the balance sheet and they will be expensed as incurred. Okay, I'm trying to uh, move the slides for you. I cannot uh, cannot get control of the slides. So maybe Jonah, if you can uh, move the slide forward. Well, let me. Can I introduce myself real quick, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. Do that before we before we move on. Jonah, do you want to go back one? So I'll just do a quick intro. I'm Courtney Edwards. I'm a senior manager at Armanino in the CFO advisory practice out here in the Denver office. So I uh, started my career at EY, have um, a technical accounting background. So I've done a ton of lease implementations over the last few years and I'm ready to, to get started today. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Courtney. Let's see if I can move the slides. So, okay. All right. All right. So, left off with the capital leases, no change. They just a change in terminology, right? In, in linguistics, they, they will be called finance leases. However, the change to the principles based determination of these lease classifications is somewhat different. Uh, the current bright lines that we all studied for. Uh, when we took the exam, uh, those will be going away. And the most onerous change of all of the new standard, there is a significant amount of new financial statement disclosures covering your lease populations, which are not easily handled or able to be handled uh, within Excel or other current uh, disclosure uh, uh, aggregation tools. On a bright side, there are numerous practical expedients and accounting policy elections meant to reduce the time and burden of adoption and ongoing accounting. There's a package of three uh, for the transition relief on the year of adoption. Now, election of this transition relief package, and it's an all or none uh, package, allows an entity to not reassess the following whether any expired or existing contracts are or contain leases. And that is, doesn't give you a free pass to continue on with bad gap. Uh, uh, this part of the expedient does not grandfather in incorrect assessments in the past, uh, such as failing to identify an embedded lease in a service or supply contract. But what it's meant to do is your determination of uh, capital lease, and operating lease, you don't, you really do not have to uh, 
go back and try to look for more of these and, and, and to get ready for the year of adoption. The lease classification for any expired or existing leases. Uh, this one allows you to all existing leases that were classified in the past. You can continue on with those classifications uh, after adopting 842. And the initial direct cost transition release. Uh, if a reporting entity elects this package of practical expedience, it does not need to reassess whether initial direct costs meet the new definition upon the adoption of ASC 842. And if elected, this package will be applied to all leases consistently. Uh, if, you, if the organization decides not to adopt this package, uh, the entity uh, will, will be forced to reassess lease classification as of the commencement date of the lease or the lease modification date. Uh, some hindsight transition relief. Uh, entities can use hindsight in determining the lease term, including lease renewal, termination and purchase options, as well in assessing any impairment of the right of use asset. The leasee should take into consideration all available information prior to the effective date, but not the events or circumstances after the effective date. It's kind of uh, get it right, uh, trying to get everything perfect on day one. Uh, you may not have considered these things in the past, but now that you know under 842, due to the classification requirements, uh, um, you know, look, look at the lease term, look at the lease renewals with a new light and determine uh, uh, in hindsight, uh, you have a way to, to get this correct. And short-term leases, as an accounting policy, uh, an organization may elect not to record short-term leases on the balance sheet. To qualify as a short-term lease, a lease, must, a lease must have an initial term of 12 months or less and not include renewal options or a purchase option that the leasee is reasonably certain to exercise. This accounting policy election is made by class of underlying asset. And uh, that may save some time, it may not, um, because there are onerous financial statement disclosure requirements far related to and far short-term leases. So uh, that one is, you know, some people are not adopting this as part of the early adoption because they did not want to track these outside of their chosen uh, lease accounting solution. Combining lease and non-lease components. Leases and organizations may choose not to separate non-lease components from the related lease components. Rather, you would account for a lease component along with all its related non-lease components as a single lease component. This accounting policy election is made by class of underlying assets. And leases who elect this would avoid the need to allocate contract consideration to various components based on their standalone prices, which minimizes the effort and saves time in applying the requirements of the new lease standard. So think of those leases that have uh, repairs or maintenance or oil changes or ink, ink, ink jet replacements, all these things. And they have some non-lease components. Um, this election would allow you to basically stop looking through the leases to pull that data out. However, um, combining lease and non-lease components will result in a higher lease liability and related uh, right of use asset balance upon adoption. So it's, it's a give or take. Um, the risk-free discount rate, this is the uh, one area uh, that is different from public companies. Um, uh, the public companies have a requirement to use their incremental borrowing rate as their discount rate and the, uh, or the rate that is uh, evident within the lease, uh, the lease agreement. Uh, however, private companies uh, have this option, the risk-free discount rate, a leasee that is not a public business entity can elect by class of underlying asset to use a risk-free discount rate determined using a period comparable to the lease term as the discount rate for the lease. 
So I, I would expect most of these to be uh, uh, elected um, upon adoption. And then it, it will matter as we see later on, because um, what you garbage in, garbage out, when you have a solution, um, you need to have all these uh, practical expedients and accounting policy elections lined up before you start. For those in the audience under IFERS, while this was a convergence project, there was a little bit of divergence from the final US and international lease guidance. The biggest divergence is that under IFERS and IAS 17 specifically, all leases placed on the balance sheet will be treated as finance leases. This may create the need for many organizations to either have two sets of books uh, for their lease accounting, one for their US GAAP reporting requirements and one for their parents uh, or uh, Consolid or if they're consolidated in uh, and needing an IFRS uh, consolidation. And to invest in a solution uh, that can easily switch. Um, you know, when, when it comes time to look at the uh, uh, software solutions, that should be question number one for, for those uh, who, who need both IFRS and US GAAP. How easily can we switch our uh, uh, and assist uh, our parent company accountants by switching the US GAAP? ASC 842 to the IFRS uh, model for calculating all the journal entries that we need. Now, lessors, we'll focus a little on lessors here. For lessors and lessor accounting, the new standard is largely unchanged from current GAAP. As for the most part, there was no controversy surrounding the current accounting for lessors under ASC 840. Lessors will still have to classify a lease as either a sales type lease, direct financing, or operating using the criteria very similar to the current gap. Leverage lease classification will be eliminated prospectively. There is some, guide, some new guidance on initial direct cost capitalization for lessors uh, to match similar ASC cost to acquire a contract guidance. Uh, for some lessors, this may result in recognizing more expenses before the start of a lease and higher margins on lease income earned over the lease term. Since the changes are really not that significant for lessors, th this webinar is, it will be focused on the leasee side of accounting. As noted earlier, the effective date is here. There will be no more extensions granted. We are present today to discuss some insights from past lease implementation projects, some methods of implementation, and some tips on how to approach the solutions needed to implement these standards. And just as importantly, we have, we have blocked out a piece of time to uh, hopefully answer your questions. Hopefully we get some questions sent in because um, you know time's running out and tick, tick, tick. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Jonah for our first polling question. All right, everyone's favorite part, the polling questions. Uh, so how ready do you feel for ASC 842? Option A, totally ready. Option B, somewhat ready. Option C, what is ASC 842? Um, hopefully that's not everyone's answer. And then option D, not available, maybe it doesn't apply to you. So we'll give this a few seconds here once I launch this poll. All right. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Still a handful of you that haven't submitted the polling question yet, so I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, moving on. Okay, so it looks like most of you are somewhat ready. Dan, Courtney, what do you guys think about that? Um, it's kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, I will say maybe shame on you for the people that selected what is AS842, but I feel like <laughs> overall this will be a good presentation for everybody. Yeah, yeah, this is, I, I figured the, <laughs> the folks on this webinar would be uh, in this somewhat ready. And, and 
and looking for uh, uh, what's, what, what we've seen uh, from actual clients uh, who have implemented already. So hopefully that, hopefully this understanding A42, I know it's, I know it was dry and, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully that helped answer some of the questions for those who said, what is A42? <laughs> but that's our background. And then how, you know, how do we apply that? And uh, I believe uh, uh, Courtney will, will start discussing uh, uh, some of those paths. Thanks, Dan. So the first section we'll go through is really identify key insights from early adoption projects. And the primary goal of this is to show just some of the challenges companies face. So numerous surveys that have been conducted noted that many companies underestimated the effort and manpower required to implement the new lease accounting rules. So whether your company has only a few, maybe dozens, hundreds, or thousands, um, of leases, your team could face some of these same challenges. And I've been working with a ton of private companies more recently too, that have also seen some of these same challenges. So as we're going through this, you will likely see some of this um, as well. Maybe not all of it, but I think it's important to really understand what public companies went through, challenges they faced. Um, so we'll go through each one of these individually on the next slides. So the first one here is contract identification and collection. So even for companies that don't have a high volume of leases, identifying lease contracts can still be very, very resource in intensive and not a straight process at all. So one reason for that is that leases are often decentralized across the company, making it difficult to identify all the leases. So there also could be, given that part of a contract can meet the definition of a lease, not all leases will be apparent. Leases could be buried within seemingly non-lease type transactions, such as product or service arrangements, and are therefore more difficult to identify. We'll go through individually what other contracts that you should be looking into to make sure there aren't embedded leases or there actually isn't leases outside of what you know now. So the reason that this is a big issue is really failure to appropriately identify a complete population of leases can have a more significant financial statement impact um, under ASC 842 than it did under legacy US GAAP, now that you're putting everything on the balance sheet. So you could be understating some of your financials if you aren't really identifying all of these. So all in all, the impact of this, there really just aren't enough resources or time to appropriately identify and evaluate leases. People are at capacity at this point. We know everyone is, is strained, so this has been um, you know, a big topic. The second, the second challenge that companies face is really the lease determination. So understanding the ASC 842 guidance really requires knowledgeable resources with a diverse and potentially complex leasing term. So you have to have that knowledge base to be able to first identify lease understand the nuances that come, come along with that. This also goes hand in hand with teams that have resource constraints. Maybe you don't have someone that can actually spend the time to learn the guidance. So it, it's just all in all, you know, it, it's hard for teams to have those skills, have the capacity. So some of the key elements, and again, these are just a few of some of the key el elements that under the new guidance that maybe weren't required uh, under ASC 840. So first one would be just the defini definition of a lease. This could include the key concept of control of an asset. So this is something that is very different from ASE 840. Do you understand just the basic definition of a lease? Another key element could be just the treatment of leases in terms of initial and subsequent measurement, disclosures, specifically the initial creation of the RU asset and lease liability, the present value of lease payments, the correct discount rate to use, do you understand the implication of reasonably certain for lease renewals and purchase options? Again, that this doesn't cover 1% of the ASC 842 guidance overall, but if you don't even know these specific terms, I think either having someone brush up on that or getting someone externally to help would be super important. Uh, so the impact of all this would just be a lack of skills knowledge to appropriately account for the new standard again, goes hand in hand with the first one, just a lack of resource and capacity as well. All right. So 
The third one here would be data capture and management. The new standard requires data points about leases that many companies have not previously tracked in their core systems. Data is super, super critical um, and understanding the lease accounting process is, is just critical. So once you've identified your leases, some questions that you can ask is how will you collect the lease data from across the company? And we'll go through some of these later on how you can do that. But where will you store the data? How will you maintain it? These are all important questions that you should already be asking your teams. If not, hopefully you're a little bit farther in the process. If not, these are questions that you should be asking now. So the overall impact of this is just a lack of centralized lease management processes and systems in place. This will typically involve multiple departments, cross-functional -func collaboration. So teams typically just don't have one repository for their leases currently. The fourth challenge here would be accounting calculations and lease reporting. Spreadsheets can be super, super inefficient and risky for all but the smallest number of leases. So if you have less than 10 leases, it's probably appropriate to, for spreadsheets, assuming that you know how to calculate what needs the nuances specific to your company. But I would say instead, you probably need a new software uh, or software upgrade that helps you effectively support the new standard. So another question that you can ask yourself, how will you calculate and report on the lease data you've captured? Another big issue with this is or challenge is disclosures. So understanding what is needed early on from a disclosure perspective helps clients prepare for year-end disclosures. For example, being able to track variable lease expense or short-term lease expense throughout the full year. So Dan touched on the short-term practical expedient. So any, um, any lease term less than 12 months, you don't have to track, you don't have to put on the balance sheet, but it is a required disclosure. So you have to be able to track that throughout the year. Are you equipped to be able to track that now? Do you need a new system to help you track that? So if correct tagging or processes are not implemented, data may be lost within just standard, standard GL accounts or expense, uh, lease expense. The impact of this newer uh, updated technology will likely be required. All right, and the last challenge is internal processes. So adopting the standard will likely require creating new internal controls and processes related to leases and maintaining an updated lease inventory. You'll likely need processes for capturing every new lease that is signed across the com company and tracking changes that occur over the life of the lease that may impact value, liability, or other aspects. So, and we've seen this on a few clients recently. So as an example, say you have a real estate group that is typically in charge of modifying the leases, updating, creating new leases. It, and typically there aren't, there isn't a line of communication to accounting to be able to say, look, here are the changes, here are the modifications. That's never necessarily been required before. So making sure you are engaging those other departments that may have control of the actual contracts, amendment changes, new contracts, and making sure that they understand that a modification to a lease, say it changes your lease term or your lease payments, that's going to impact your financials, right? You have to update your lease calculation to reflect that. So making sure that you have you have really sourced everybody within the other departments, making sure everyone is aware of the new process and what accounting needs as, as part of that. So the impact for this would be just cross-functional involvement and support that's needed. All right, and we'll go to a polling question. All right, thank you so much, Courtney. So we'll launch polling question number two for everybody. This one is, what is the most challenging part of implementing the new lease standard for your organization? Contract identification and collection, lease determination, data capture and management, accounting calculations and lease reporting. That seems to be the winning one currently as I'm watching the results <laughs> come in. Uh, internal processes, and I don't know. <clears throat> I'll give everyone a few more uh, seconds here to put in their answers. It looks like it's a very consistent resounding yes on the accounting calculations and lease reporting as results are coming in. This is very interesting. Uh, a couple more seconds. Looks like that's almost everyone. Awesome. All right, so this is the result. Courtney, what are you thinking when you see this? 
Uh, I think that's pretty accurate just from what we've seen from clients. Um, I will say I thought the contract identification and collection would be a little bit higher, but I mean, I think that's most people are just struggling with the calculations and lease reporting at this point, making sure they understand everything that goes in to the calculation, that any nuances within their contracts have been captured. So I, I, I would agree. I think that's pretty on, on point. Alrighty, so the next section is really understanding what level of preparation must be done to avoid time delays. So what I've put together just a checklist for implementation and bear with me a little bit because the, it'll be a lot of wording and context, um, but I think it's important to go through each one of these no matter where you are in the process. Let me change this. So these are really the 10 steps that, that we'll go through. So the following checklist includes actionable steps to help you as you begin planning and assessing the compliance for your organization. If you've already begun, this is really a checklist may give you new ideas or just approaches to help you avoid common pitfalls. Maybe you didn't think of something that you should have. You can go back and do that now. Um, so we'll go through each one of these in detail. And then once the presentation is done, you guys can flip back through this once the slides are done or once the webinar is finished and you can download some of these slides. So the first one is assess required resources. This is really important. While some organizations may have enough staff hours available, as well as in-house leasing knowledge to undertake the entire compliance initiative, many companies will not. We have seen time and time again, people just, again, don't have the capacity. So once you have a basic, basic preliminary understanding of the number of existing leases from across the company, management should really determine whether external resources are needed to help with the initiative, particularly the more resource intensive activities such as lease abstraction and implementing new technology. And the second one would be identifying existing leases. So the first step, once you have your project team in place, you have your, your resources on hand, you'll need to begin by locating all of your company's lease documents. This typically involves working across departments and business units to survey all relevant areas about the existence of leases. As you collect the lease documents, an initial analysis of leases should help you uncover the operational accounting or data issues that you, you'll need to resolve. So you'll have at least a starting point. The second aspect of this would be evaluate completeness of a lease population. This should be your top priority. This is probably the only thing that I have highlighted in this entire presentation. This is time and time again, something that auditors will pick on. This is, this should be a very, very focused um, activity for your team, without a doubt. So performing a completeness review involves a number of activities. This could include entity-wide workshops, diagnostic surveys, reconciling various data sets, GL, GL analytics, sample contract reviews. So contract reviews are pretty critical and an important complement to preliminary scoping activities. So reviewing a sample of material leases can provide insight into one key contract fe uh, features impact impacting the accounting analysis. The second one, really identifying directional financial statement implications of adopting the new standard. It could also provide insight into relevant data that could allow management to make more informed decisions around expedients and policies. And we'll go through, again, I know it's been touched on a little bit, but some of the expedients and policies that your team should have at least a good grasp on at this point to be able to apply. Another one I want to touch on is really the GL analytics. I highly, highly recommend this if your team has not done this already. So this would be reviewing AP subledger for recurring expenses, reviewing PL accounts for recurring expenses that could really help identify leases not previously known. There have been multiple instances where we've had clients that will perform this and identify additional leases outside of, of what was known to date. And I think if this is just a super helpful tool to be able to make sure that you have a complete population of leases. So the third one here is examine for embedded leases. This is something that clients time and time again miss. So I, again, want to stress this. This is a, also a very important part of validating completeness of your lease population. This is including making certain that embedded leases were properly identified. This has become a huge step and a critical step in the transition. It involves judgment, a lot of judgment, and often involves detailed contract reviews 
and obtaining a deep understanding of the terms and economics of, of the contracts. Um, this sh should be done, please. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. Examine for embedded leases and also have documentation around this. So this assessment is really vital to help ensure lessees do not underestimate the balance sheet impact. So if you don't do this and auditors come in and say they identify leases outside of the scope, you don't have a complete population, that means you're understating your balance sheet. That is not something that you want. So highly recommend doing this. Um, so leases can be found in many different kinds of service contracts in other types of agreements. And I'll go through a few examples. So the first bucket would be service agreements, thinking through office consumables, outsourcing services, software services. Um, if you're thinking through office equipment, so are there vending machines that you lease, computers, printers, copiers, scanners, IT service arrangements. So any dedicated servers, data centers, data co-locations. Are there any vehicle leases that you may have, tractors, vans, trailers, delivery services? Are there any warehouses or supply storages that you guys lease that you're, you're not aware of? So once you've really thought through this, you'll likely need other departments to help assist with this, but this is definitely something that needs to be done. And there really needs to be some type of documentation around what was done. So you can say you examine for embedded leases, at least have some kind of talk track or some documentation around what you did to account for that. It'd be helpful going forward just to make sure you've covered all your bases. Ready? The next one would be updating your lease inventory and making the appropriate transition elections and policy choices. So once you have, we've collected all your leases, you have all your lease documents, including embedded leases. Next step would be creating or updating a complete list of inventory. This is really a one repository go-to place that you can see lease type, all the leases that you, that you have. It's one document or one software uh, place that you, you have this. And this will serve really as your starting point for collecting all the relevant data you'll need for ASC 842 compliance. In addition, the new standard provides various transition-related expedients and policy elections that can really ease the level of effort required to adopt the new standard. So the first, these are only a few, again, I'm reiterating this from, from what Dan said earlier, just because this is something that's super important and can really help as far as easing the burden. So the first one, so upon adoption of the new standard, companies are required to apply a modified retrospective transition approach. And you can choose between two options. One would be adjust comparative periods and do not adjust comparative periods. So you have to choose between, between those two. Uh, Dan mentioned this earlier and I did as well, the short-term lease elections. So if, again, if elected leases that have one, a lease term of less than 12 months, and also two, this is super important, um, um, do not contain a reasonably certain purchase option, will not be recognized on the balance sheet. Um, again, you still have to track for disclosure purposes and that's a separate a separate thing, but just wanted to, to point that out. Also, this will be talked about multiple times, is really the treasury risk-free rate election for discount rates. So companies who are one, private entities, and two, very importantly, do not plan to go public, can, util can utilize the treasury risk-free rate to measure the lease liability and REU asset. This is definitely easier to apply. The discount rate, trying to figure that out, the implicit or explicit rate outside of that is just a really complex and difficult task. And I highly recommend if you can take this expedient to do so. Um, all you do, you go to the treasury's website, you download the rates from, from the website and the transition date, you'll use those rates going forward. So it, it gives you the rates firsthand. There's not a lot of analysis behind it. It, it makes it makes it very easy. All right, so the next one here is identify data gaps. To efficiently identify potential gaps, it's first uh, important to first understand and leverage the company's existing data sets. So the starting point again would be the lease inventory that we talked about um, in number four. So many companies also start with existing support used for their five-year commitment, footnote disclosures. They also may look to real estate equipment lease management tools or contract repositories if you have those. From there, a thorough understanding of the new standard would be necessary to identify which additional data fields must be, must be captured. 
So for purposes of the transition, some of the key data points that you should already have a good handle on would be, and these are just a few, I will say that. So lease term and dates. When, are, when is the commencement date, the possession date? What's the remaining term? Are there options such as like renewals, purchase options, early terminations that you need to consider? Um, another aspect would be payment details. So timing of payments, either advance or arrears, fixed versus variable, and any incentives or allowances that you have. So all of these have a financial statement impact or could potentially have a financial statement impact that you need to be aware of upfront and also be tracking in somehow. Um, other existing accounts that may impact the transition balances, if there are existing prepaid or deferred rent balances, do you know how to account for that on day one? Um, any initial direct costs, do you have an idea of what those look like? And again, discount rate. So for many companies, lease data wasn't um, tracked for like the discount rate um, or really needed for financial reporting purposes. So this is something you'll have to do, have to do now. So all in all, your goal is to identify all the missing data types and create a plan for how to obtain the data for current and for future leases. The next one here is evaluate the impact. So with lease inventory and information collected, you can begin assessing the impact of the new standards on your company's financial statements, ratios, metrics, and debt covenants. I highly recommend just working with different stakeholders. This could be investors, banks, external auditors, to disclose the expected impact and mitigate any risk associated with it. I uh, highly recommend talking to your auditors up front if you have any nuances in your contracts. You can do this, be transparent up front so you're not getting, getting pinged for it later. Also, if debt covenants are likely to be affected, make sure you're working with lenders to avoid violations, make sure they're aware. Um, I have definitely seen that making sure you're transparent up front before some of the stuff even gets kicked off is super helpful in the end with just communication with some of these key stakeholders. All right, number seven would be assess and revise internal controls and policies. So again, your company may need to make significant process changes to comply with a new standard, changing the workflow for new contracts so that your accounting team can identify and track lease data, to managing changes in terms of existing lease contracts, you'll need to evaluate and redesign processes across departments. This is true for almost every client I've seen. There is some type of process change or getting another department involved. I think initially people think that this is just gonna be an accounting impact and it absolutely is not. It most likely and almost always will involve other people within the company that maybe you didn't consider before. So this is really just an important part of planning for your future state of compliance after the FASB deadline. Number eight would be identify and deploy supporting technology. So again, relying on manual efforts to collect, manage, and track lease data, perform calculations, and create reports for compliance can be super, super labor intensive and error prone for companies with more than a handful of leases. I've seen errors time and time again where um, this has all been tracked in Excel and it is just very difficult um, for that. So the next section in the presentation that Daniel Glover will cover technology readiness. So I won't touch too much on this, but also a very, very important part. So the next one. Hey, Courtney, real quick, just for the sake of time, um, just for CPE uh, folks out there, we do have to launch another polling question. So I'll quickly okay. interrupt you real quick so we can launch that to make sure everyone gets their CPE. So polling question number three, uh, now that we've reviewed the checklist and we'll see, Courtney will talk on the last uh, couple here in a second, uh, where are you in the process of the implementation? Uh, haven't started early in the process, somewhere in the middle, almost done, completed, not applicable to you. And again, we'll give this a few, few more seconds here for the tally results to come in. It looks like for the most part, um, everyone's in the first three stages, Courtney. So haven't started early in the process, somewhere in the middle. So that's where most people are kind of at right now. Let's see here. All right. So let's share the results here for everyone to see. And Courtney, I'll let you kind of talk on that too, as you talk about these last uh, steps in your checklist. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, um, it definitely the first, if you're in the first three buckets, I, and I'll read this in a minute on the bottom line, but getting started now would be 
priority. A lot of people think that you can start in Q1 or Q2 of next year, and that's just not the case. That is too late. So starting as soon as you can and really getting a better understanding of what needs to be done is super critical at this point. But also we have a lot of, we've had a lot of clients recently that are in the same boat and we'll get it done, but um, just definitely get started. Um, so the ninth one is abstract in-store lease data. So this will likely take place in parallel to some of the other steps. We've touched on this a little bit. Make sure you're allotting time for collecting additional data needed that isn't found in the individual contracts, such as a discount rate. And I will say um, a detailed examination of a document, such as like a complex retail or real estate lease could take two to three hours of effort. So really understanding the time that might go into it and reviewing some of these contracts is important. And the last one we'll touch on here is review and revise for ongoing compliance. So once the implementation project is complete, you'll need to maintain compliance going forward. So this just isn't an implementation and then nothing happens after. You have to um, implement these processes going forward. So take time to review um, the effectiveness of your policies and processes. Make sure you're in a good place going forward. All right, we already did the polling questions. So let's skip that. So here are some initial questions to ask for implementation. I'm not gonna go through these, but once you guys get this presentation, these are questions that you should be asking your team. Um, do you have any sublease arrangement? That's important. So just make sure um, you're aware that these questions need to be asked and you have an, an answer to each of these. All right, bottom line, start now. Please don't wait any longer. Uh, the year end is approaching. Number two, get mobilized and learn from others. Make sure you have your resources, your team in place. Uh, number three, and get help where needed if you, um, if you need help. And now I will turn it over to Dan to talk about technology. All right, thank you, Courtney. And see if I can move the slides or not. Sorry, folks. All right, I don't believe I'm able to do this. So I'll have my, my helper uh, move the slides. So uh, if you can take control and uh, you'll be in charge. So on the, on, the uh, on the technology readiness questions, this is just another area to ask some of the same questions and, and have the answers ready. So our, our first tip is these readiness questions we've addressed earlier, and I'm gonna leave one big tip, which is, you need to have these answers before implementing any solution. You need to understand the standard and what you're going to adopt and everything. So before you go trying to make journal entries or, or picking a solution, have these answers. So we'll go to the next slide. The uh, cons considerations and, and options. Um, you know what, let's, let's go to the next slide uh, for uh, purposes of, of time. Um, you know, on these on these uh, implementations, you know, I t there are, we, we're going to categorize three implementation approaches in, in this in this uh, program to becoming compliant. And the first we're going to call a basic implementation. This is the fastest, cheapest self-service implementation model using off-the-shelf software which will prom primarily uh, will be obtained under a SAS model. Uh, some downsides to this basic approach is the reliance on internal experts and the time and the lack of customization in some of the software solutions. Uh, we've been asked about using Excel. I will speak about Excel a few times. Uh, it is our belief that Excel may work with uh, a, a very small population of leases, uh, two, three, you start getting to four or five, it gets a little, it's a little hairy, and uh, but you know once looking at the calculations needed for the financial statement foot requirements under under ASC 842, uh, we've seen many organizations opt to utilize an off-the-shelf solution after hitting three or more leases. All right, next uh, the full or, or tailored implementation. Uh, these these solutions provide a more individualized and robust accounting and lease management solution. Uh, they do require more time and resources to manage. Uh, there will be new software on your side uh, to manage and integrate into your accounting and resource systems as well. 
Uh, many industries already have this type of, of software solution. Uh, if you're in the real estate industry or uh, a cap heavy, uh, CapEx heavy uh, uh, with hundreds or thousands of equipment leases, uh, those are the candidates and users of these types of tailored implementations. They're looking more for more than just ASC 842 compliance. They're, they're looking for a solution that offers more basic, uh, more than the basics. Uh, next slide, the final path uh, is, a, a, the, the final path is, involves outsourcing of the lease accounting services. You know, lease accounting is not a point in time exercise. Uh, you, you will not be doing this once and done and then, you know, thinking, you know, we, we did it and we applied it. No, um, you know, leasing is a key part of the operations of many organizations and uh, lease pools are dynamic. You know, the outsourcing agreement uh, generally would also cover this day to month to year two accounting. Outsourcing simplifies the lease accounting compliance issues by relying on an outside service provider like Armanino or another to handle and provide those monthly, quarterly, and annual lease accounting journal entries and disclosure content based on an ongoing review and updating of your leasing activities. There is a definite cost benefit analysis to this path but there is a defined scalability aspect to this analysis uh, based on the scope and type of your leasing activities your organization has entered into. All right, next slide. All right, we've hit our final polling question. Uh, what path have you chosen to become compliant with ASC 842? And let's see, I'll, Dan, I'll put you on the spot here. Let's see if you can predict what the results are going to be. What do you think from your expertise and your time seeing clients implement the standard? What are you thinking? I, I am seeing uh, uh, 70 basic, 15 outsource, and uh, 15, I need help. It looks like you are pretty close on the money there. Okay. And hopefully we, yeah, okay. Uh, in 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 uh, to save some time, if you if you can go to uh, next slide. Major software solutions is where I, where I'll stick here. So, you know, for the basic solution, uh, there are a slew of new software solutions out there specifically meant to address the compliance requirements of ASC eight forty two. Trulian, Lease Query, NetLease, Lease Crunch. These are some of the solutions I've seen, and these are some of the solutions that have been born to address the compliance issues. Out of the box, they will handle the, the, the ASC 842 com accounting compliance issues, uh, including the onerous lease footnote. All of these solutions are basing their pricing on a SaaS subscription model per lease, per year pricing. Um, if, if you're looking for that basic, the 70% or 60%, uh, you'll probably focus in on names like that. Uh, one word of caution and advice, though, on these solutions. Uh, these are newish. Uh, you know, it's a new standard came out. Um, these, some of these companies, all these companies basically were born. So they are rapidly adding more features and customization to their solutions. They've started with the compliance, and now they're working to be more like a full uh, uh, lease package. So if you're interested in more than just a compliance piece, um, you know, look at these solutions and see, they may already have added stuff since the last time I've seen them and last time I've, I've driven them. So Trulian is, is one solution we work with uh, and which is rapidly developing more customized and tailored features in their solution. Uh, if you want more than just compliance, compare, compare these people and see what they're planning uh, for the future. Uh, the mature tailored software solutions, uh, those are mainly, like I said, in the real estate industry or those with massive equipment leases that want to do uh, some administrative uh, and, and tracking and such. CoStar, TurboLease, Lease Harbor, you know if you're in the market for one of those. And for those with a small population of leases, some are going to try to use Excel. It's not impossible to do, um, but subject to error, and it will not help you with your uh, uh, financial statement disclosure piece, which again is the most onerous uh, piece of the standard. If it was me, I, I would define small, at least population pools three. Um, other uh, others others may vary, 
Uh, but there is one one lease solution I did did want to throw up there. Uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, lease query uh, has a lease this item called lease guru. Uh, if you have one or two leases, um, it, it uh, according uh, to their website, it's free. So um, they obviously are hoping that you will move up the number of leases in the future. But if you have one or two leases, check out that lease uh, query and uh, and and uh, their lease guru. So. Um, so yeah, I'll get I'll get right to it. you know the the final the final pitfalls, um, you know. I mean, what I mean, really, what we're seeing is people were so worried about getting the initial asset liability on the books that they forget about day two, and day two and and monthly statements have to be quarterly statements have to be under gap, and that has been probably of all the common pitfalls noted. That is the one where where we came in on year two of the audit. And we're like, what happened? Uh, because there were there were some people that were in the public business realm that had to adopt this uh, before the, uh, the private companies, and there there were we were kind of surprised at how many people uh, did not recognize it. it was not a one and done exercise. Uh, the, you know, this is uh, leasing is a is, is a vibrant activity, and. Um, I think we have four minutes, so I, I really would like to uh, just go forward with, again, it's here. There's no further um, extensions. There, there is no more Hail Marys. The COVID Hail Mary's over. Uh, like it's, it's, it's back to putting this on. And uh, th this could have, if you have more than two or three leases, this is a substantial uh, amount of time. And, and the impacts uh, could be substantial. And, uh, you know, you, we're approaching uh, busy season, audit season for these 1231 year ends, and you will be judged by your auditors and you will be judged by the users of your financial statements on how you how you applied this and how you disclosed these uh, lease accounting items. So, um, yeah, long story short, hopefully, um, you know, you know, you're out of time and there are some solutions out there. Pick one and make make your decisions and, and go and go. Uh, the audit will be here quicker than we know it. All right, Q and A. Yeah, so speaking of out of time, uh, we have a few more minutes here left, uh, Dan and Courtney. Uh, maybe Dan, I'll throw a question your way, Courtney, if you wanna take a look at the Q and A feature to see if you find a question that you think it would be good to answer live, because we actually had quite a few questions come in. So for those of you that answered the ask questions in the Q and A tool, um, if we're not able to answer it live, uh, just because we're coming up on time, uh, Dan and Courtney will do their best to follow up with you each individually. Um, but for now, Dan, let me throw a question at you. Um, do you have any examples of what financial statements will look like upon adoption? Um, and maybe if that one's a bit too complex to kind of answer, there's another one here that's um, a good one here. How much are the software solutions charging? You mentioned per lease, per entity. Yeah. Can you give some, yeah. some clarity okay. there? Yeah, yeah. I, uh... So on the first question, um, I, uh, my tip to you is to go to the public companies had to adopt in, in 2019. And the standard is identical, including the disclosure requirements. The only thing that's really different is, is what discount rate you use. So uh, my, 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 uh, what I've been telling my clients is go to, to uh, find your favorite client that you, or favorite public company that you know has leases and go to the first quarter of 2019 because that will show the initial impact and initial disclosures of the adoption of ASC 842. So 2019, um, uh, 10Ks will be at the end of the year, but if you wanna see it upon adoption, go to the, the first queue of 2019 for a calendar year uh, public company. And uh, on the, on the uh, how much do these uh, basic solutions cost? Again, it's the, it, every, Every software company is in the subscription SaaS-based model system, right? It's a per year, per per lease kind of contract. And, and so what I've been seeing is, depending on your number of leases, right, there's a scalability. It could be 65 bucks a lease per year, every year, to 100 bucks a lease per year, every year. And, and so when you start, when you start shopping, you, uh, you, they will have these uh, pricing tiers, like one to five leases is 500 bucks plus uh, you know, a hundred dollars a lease, things like that. So, but uh, if you just want to just walk out of here with the back of the napkin, multiply the, the number of leases by uh, uh, 70 to a hundred and 
that's kind of your recurring spend on that solution. All right, perfect. Thank you, Dan. And we have uh, a time for maybe one more question. Um, someone did chat in a good question earlier. So let me back up. And this might be uh, maybe pushed towards Courtney. Um, this was during your section. Uh, Tanea asked, we are a franchisor and are not on our franchisees lease. Uh, will ASC 842 change this? Good question. That is a very good question. Um, I have not seen the franchi franchise or franchi franchisee, but I can get an answer out um, whenever we send the slides out to that. I'll have to look into that one. Um, there was one other comment about what the website was or mentioned for rates. I feel like this will be important for everybody to use. So um, if you Google the daily treasury par yield curve rates, it's on the US Department of the Treasury website. You'll select 2022 if you're adopting as of 1 1 2022, and it'll give you the rates, and you can export those to Excel. All right, perfect. Well, that brings us to our conclusion for today's presentation. Um, so thanks, Dan and Courtney. I think that wraps up our questions for the day. And as I mentioned earlier, if we weren't able to get to your question live during today's webinar, we will follow up via email. Uh, so keep an eye out if you were the ones asking questions to all of our attendees. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you close out of this webinar. Uh, we thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Go Cardinals. <laughs>